<laughs> so uh, y'all are here for uh, PostgreSQL hooks for fun and profit. I don't, you can actually make profit. I wouldn't try it, but you can. Um, my name is David Fetter. I'm a husband and father of four, a longtime PostgreSQL contributor, and I've expanded SQL. Um, if anybody's used the writable with clauses in Postgres, that's the thing I spearheaded and drove to uh, uh, inclusion, and now other people are starting to, to use them. Um, I think there's a way to do this on Meetup, but I, I depend utterly on, you know, feedback from people so I can, uh, so I can improve. Um, so, why don't we get started? Um, have you ever updated or deleted every row by accident? <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> yeah, that's not super fun. And um, oops. Uh, wanted to slow people down when they were trying to auth your at your database too quickly, or or maybe there was a bug and something was authing very fast, or maybe there's an attacker. Um, how about made a cool constraint that just happens to require that you be in serializable isolation. Um, quick aside, who thinks they understand isolation levels lower than serializable well enough to write code against them? You sure? <laughs> nope, no hands? <laughs> okay. I take a stab. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm, that's one of my pet projects. I would like to make serializable the default and make it difficult to, you know, pull away from it because nobody really understands the lower levels. Um, how about uh, how about if you has anybody here wanted to replace the uh, traveling salesman problem based uh, planner with one based on simulated annealing? I mean, y'all are bright here. <laughs> Maybe somebody will want will, will have wanted to do that. Great layers, excellent as it is. Yeah, well. <laughs> okay, so um, to to solve this, you could try to lock out anybody who could make a mistake. Let me know when you find somebody like that, like that couldn't make a mistake. <laughs> person doesn't have access to my data. <laughs> yeah. Because they don't exist. Right. Um, so. You could hope the network layer handles the, the, the authing too fast problem. Um, but while hope is a strategy, it's usually not a great effective strategy. <laughs> I mean, it's a strategy. Um, and you also better hope that your network layer isn't Mallory. So this familiar to this terminology familiar? OK. Um, so. Uh, in, in security circles, you have a bunch of people with a bunch of different names, Alpha, Bravo. Um, <clears throat> so there's Eve, who's an eavesdropper, and Mallory is a, a malicious person who can go futz with your packets. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Mallory is kind of what you don't want to have your network layer acting on as. Um, so let's see, you wanted to make that cool constraint that requires serializable isolation. Um, you could add a check for that in all the triggers that you write. <laughs> and you still wouldn't be 100% sure that you'd gotten it all. Um, and as far as replacing the TSP based planner, um, I understand that in other systems it is possible to replace the planner, but you basically do a complete rewrite. You don't like, there's not a way you could do this. You just, you know, you just take the code and, and you uh, try to try to make a new thing out of it. So uh, hooks to the rescue. Um, so I'm I'm gonna guess that not everybody here knows what these are in the Postgres context. Um, but I, show of hands, who knows, 
We've seen them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so y'all bear with me. I'm just going to kind of... Um, so <clears throat> just in general, uh, a hook is a thing that uh, at a certain junction in the code um, takes a look to see whether there's a another an, an executable that has been sort of pointed to somehow and if it's there it executes it and then it, it returns control to the um, to, to the underlying thing whatever that junction was um, and so you can think of this as going in kind of um, a few phases there's snag where you attempt to intercept the attempt to do an action so like this is pretty broad and general and that's because it's broad and general in the Postgres code um, so like for example trying to auth the the attempt to do that would be the thing that you catch and you don't you haven't executed any of the code behind it yet because your hook comes in first um, then um, we're gonna make some attempt to be polite about this so we catch the state that it was in before. Um, you could, in theory, write several different hooks um, for, a given, uh, for a given action. And when you do that, they are executed in alphabetical order. So if you need an ordering, you can kind of um, make them, you know, tweak it like that. Um, <clears throat> then you actually run the code that the hook is supposed to do at the point where it's supposed to do it. Um, and then because we're being polite and we'd like a system that actually functions, we set the state back to where it was before and continue, um, assuming it hasn't aborted your query or whatever it is that it was meant to do. Um, you do need to write these in C right now. Um, I don't know for sure if anybody is working on ways to write them in like Python or or Rust or whatnot, but right now they're C. Um, it's not too bad. Um, and uh, here's the here's what a kind of a bare minimum um, piece of this looks like. I don't have a pointer here, do I? Um, so basically. Uh, the hook code will have this preamble, and it'll have uh, Postgres.h, that's the one that, that it must have. Um, then any headers you need for the execution that you're going to do. So like if you're in the parser context, you would include headers that had to do with that. If you're going to make a function. Anyway, there's, there's a, like you, you decide and what, what things you're going to need. and you'll know pretty well whether you needed them by, you know, <laughs> removing one randomly and seeing if it still works. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, and then there's a thing called PG module magic, which is just what it sounds like. It's a macro that handles all the stuff of being a module in Postgres. You don't really have to worry too, too much about the inner guts of it. Other people have, have banged on that pretty hard so that you don't have to. Um, but you can if you really want to. Um, and then there's uh, all the all the hooks have to have these two functions, um, which is init and fini, which is to say the entering the hook code and then the exiting the the hook code part. Um, alrighty. So this is sort of a little bit like an example, but this is not an actual hook. Um, so when you grab the state of the of the execution or of the um, thing, um, each hook will have its own data type, and so you have to kind of persist that in a in a holding variable. So it's like previous system hook is the is now set to the current system hook, and then you assign a black hole hook to the um, uh, to the current system hook, and you're off to the races. Um, this bit could be very, very small or very, very large. 
A uh, little later I'm going to show you a fairly small one that I think is still useful. Um, uh, but you know if you're if you're for example replacing the um, the optimizer there might be a few more lines of code in there. <laughs> um, you know just okay so uh, and then in PG Fini, you just restore the state that you had cached before, uh, just so you so you can so you can move on and be a good citizen inside the code. Um, it's hard to get a count. I'm working on this. I think there's 82 hooks in the Postgres code. Um, I'm working on a patch to document them all and make them show up in man pages and whatnot because <laughs> I got sick of fig trying to figure out how many there were um, but I haven't uh, I haven't got that that there yet um, they go all the way up and down the code so like from the from the very first part of any Postgres execution from auth all the way through the the planner and the executor and the way to get back tuples it's like there, there's places where you can inject yourself um, is that how these functions are being handled right now by Postgres code? Uh, no, they're just like in in many 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 cases the um, the the hook is just there in case somebody wants to use it, and so it checks for the presence of okay. hook code, mm -hmm. and I'll show a little bit about how that works um, operationally anyway, um, and then it just keeps uh, keeps going on. Um, one major exception to that is the PSQL client, which appears to be written entirely out of hooks. <laughs> um, I don't know why, but that's how that's what they decided to. Um, so <coughs> now here's my here's where I bring up some boring C code, and I hope it's. Okay, there's this big enough for people to see, or do you want a um, bigger font size? Oops. <laughs> Let's try bigger. Let's try bigger this time. Um, okay. So this is a hook that. Well, let's let's see what this code is doing. I'll just kind of step through it. I hope you don't get too bored. Um, so, as previously mentioned, uh, include postgres.h, that just means a bunch of stuff comes in. In this case, uh, there's a function that we're going to write, so the function manager header needs to come in. Um, and parse analysis comes in because we are <coughs> looking for things in the query tree. Now, <coughs> what is this thing? Um, and of course, we need a we need to log stuff in case we send up an error message visible to the user. So e log, e report, that kind of that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so what are we doing here? Uh, well, in a few lines of code, we're just going to make sure that nobody does any unqualified deletes or updates anywhere in your database, and. Uh, <laughs> I've snagged myself enough times on this that I find it useful and I would like to <laughs> uh, make it a part of Postgres, um, at least optionally. Um, so uh, moving right along, so there's this module magic that makes it into a Postgres module and all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, uh, I guess I could have pulled these out into their own header file, but for two of these, it seemed it seemed a little. I mean, it's a, it's 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 basically an aesthetics call. You you decide if you want to if you want to make a special header for this, you can go ahead and do it. Um, and here's where we're getting to like a, a piece of it that's starting to 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 be part of what we're actually doing. Um, there's a post pars analyze hook. So what that 
what that means is that once you've finished parse analysis, which is it can be kind of a complicated thing where um, rewrite rules happen and views get expanded into the tables that they're into the yeah into the tables that they're composed of and, and stuff like that. But once you're once you're done with um, parse analysis and you're starting to hand off to the uh, planner. Um, this is the point where we want to step in and, and say, whoa there, yeah, if we need to. Um, so, and complains where this is not present. So there's one function here, so that's what we needed the function manager <laughs> to deal with. Um, it takes a parse state and a query. So if the if it's a command if it's a command if it's a uh, update or a delete, so skip everything else, skip the selects, inserts, utility commands, all that. Um, if it's one of those, then we continue. Um, we want to make sure that the that there is something to look at in the join tree. Um, so I just stuck that assert in there. In case it should ever become, uh, in case there should ever be a time when the join tree doesn't magically appear when you do one of these. Um, what is the join tree? Uh, so that's the um, that's the part that's that hints to the um, planner that a join is actually going to occur. Um, okay. But it it gets it happens that it gets instantiated for everything and we may need to refactor that at some point um, but at this point every everything that that's that's um, I'm not sure if this is true of utility statements anymore anyway um, anything that you normally think of as an SQL command select insert update delete um, has a join tree structure that comes out of it um, once you're once parse analysis is done Okay, so if we have the um, join tree crawls, and that's where the that's where that where clause would be. Um, if it's null, uh, then we have we have found our our query that we don't want anybody ever to execute. So that basically says that there wasn't a where clause of any type. Um, again, this could change, like if if in parse analysis phase, we start to throw away um, identity clauses, then I'll need to rethink this a little bit, how this works. Um, because right now, if you put in a, t a tautology in your where clause, it will still get passed down as a not null um, qual. Like it'll still be there even though it, it means nothing. Um, so, and so now we basically just, now we basically just decide which error to throw, <laughs> right? Update without a where clause gets one error, delete without an error, a where clause gets a different error, um, and we're done. Um, just for completeness, I mean, here's what PG init and PG fini look like. <laughs> There's not a lot of there there. Um, I just persist the, um, the the state of the post parse analysis hook into a variable um, that lasts in, that that's in a memory context context that lasts long enough um, for this to actually go, and then in the PG Fini I just rest restore it. Yes. And you you said before that these would uh, these functions above would execute alphabetically, and you're talking about this has a single function, right? This is simple, mm -hmm. but you could have multiple functions, but you would want to do them in a way that was alphabetical to make sure that they happen sequentially. Uh, so the question was just for the mic. Um, uh, do the uh, do I do the functions in this part execute alphabetically and I apologize for not being clear it's the names of the hooks that execute alphabetically how you arrange your code in here is is up to you um, but uh, yeah so the the hook names at a, any given juncture will execute in alphabetical order 
but the functions inside this code are kind of opaque to that. Um, questions, comments? Yes? Uh, the, that's only hooks where there's a tie at a particular juncture. If, if one hook is called earlier in the code than another hook, then alphabetical order would matter, right? Right, so the question was, does, is this a global ordering of, of hook names? And the answer is, as you, as you guessed, is no. Uh, it's just that at any given hook, the hook, at any given place where you could put hooks, if you have multiple ones, then they execute in alphabetical order right there. And then it, it, then the context is entirely forgotten, and you move on to the next place where there might be a hook. And then it has its own ordering. So, so it is the the ordering is um, I mean it's scoped at the at the individual hook level. Then yes. Okay. Yes, it's scoped at the hook level. Um, and yeah, oh. so <laughs> it seems like an awful lot of bookkeeping if you wanted to make a, a total ordering. But I guess <laughs> I guess there could be a reason. Uh, I just can't think of off the off the top of my head what that might be. If you were not a C programmer and you wanted to use this hook, and you started assembling them. You're like, oh, I want to get the, this feature, and I want to get this feature. Mm -hmm. Like, most people would assemble that into one, like, mega hook. And well, you would probably... Uh, OK, so uh, if you're not a C programmer and you want to use hooks, you're in a kind of a rare category. <laughs> like, because... Um, Generally, the the if, or if you want to hooks use hooks directly, you're, you're kind of you're kind of um, in a rare category. But um, let's say you have uh, let's say you have three different hooks in your auth at, at the auth stage. Let's say, um, and they come from different vendors. You just want to make sure that that they don't step on each other. Um, and you, you might not even have access to the code. Like you might just get like a DLL on Windows or a .so <coughs> on, on other platforms, and that would be, <laughs> like that would be your hook code. And you don't really, you know, uh, un unless you're disassembling it. Now I don't know of any commercial hook vend or proprietary hook vendors, but I mean that's, I know that there are proprietary hooks running all over um, Amazon RDS, for example. Um, and that's part of how they ma manage to make the guarantees that they can make, is that they have hooks in there that kind of prevent you from really being super user and hitting the actual file system on their little nodes, <laughs> um, or their giant nodes, depending what what you feel like paying for. Um, okay. Okay, so that was our boring C code. Um, <laughs> I, I hope that the, the cyclomatic complexity of that one wasn't too, too bad. <laughs> um, oh, here we go, live demo. <laughs> now this is where I show either foolishness or, well, probably foolishness. Um, oops. Oh man. <coughs> okay. Um, so let's see here. So this does kind of what you would expect it to do. It just <laughs> lacking the um, lacking the hook, it just goes and deletes it. <clears throat> yeah. 
Here's a little magic you use for um, developing and debugging this thing. If you really wanted to insert this hook code for, for production, you would have it on have it load on um, instance start. And you would ha do alter system or something along that line in order to make it go. Um, but in this case, okay, so now let's try it again. Poof. <laughs> Right? So <laughs> now this was a low stakes experiment, right? Who has nothing in it yet? <laughs> but you can imagine that if you are, um, if you are at a, a, a console and you're hitting control C really, really fast <laughs> because you're hoping that you can <laughs> uh, undo the terrible thing that you just did, uh, this keeps you from having to <laughs> suffer that particular indignity. Um, now, this could go a lot further. Like, for example, it could look for tautological um, where clauses that basically come out to where true. Um, and it could disallow those too. Um, but it, at some, but it, there, there's only so far you can really go with that because um, you're basically, uh, well, okay, so you have a piece of code and you're trying to figure out whether it's going to stop executing. Does anybody remember what that one is? <laughs> that, that problem is called? It's the halting problem and it's known to be unsolvable by any system. So, <laughs> so at some point your, your ability to, to analyze the, the um, qual random calls that you get is kind of limited in that way. Yes? Is there a way that you could hook into make an implicit transaction so that if, the, if, the, if after a delete or update, if after a delete the number of rows in the table is zero, you implicitly fail the transaction? Uh, the question is, is there a way to um, ab ab abort the transaction if the number of rows in the table at the end of it is zero? And the answer is, I don't know. I mean, you would, you would have um, access to information of that type <coughs> at the end of a statement, and you would probably have it before the <coughs> transaction closed out. Um, but that puts you in the nasty situation of having actually executed that query, and so you've made a whole bunch of new, or well, in this case, you've marked a bunch of rows dead. Um, and then you would then have to, well, no, they're not marked dead. You're I should take this offline. <laughs> Sorry. This, this is, it, it would, yes, it would be possible. It would be expensive. Um, not it as could, expensive as your company from taking loss. That's true. <laughs> it would not be as expensive as recovering from data loss. <laughs> so, um, uh, let's see here. Alrighty, so that didn't utterly fail. Um, so I'd just like to talk a little bit about the serializable. Um, I'm still working on this hook because I want to make it broadly general. Um, what I'd actually like to do eventually is um, make a GUC setting, which is sort of Postgres's configuration uh, variables. Uh, it stands for Grand Unified Configuration. Um, I'd like to make a setting so that you can just say that, you know, this database is in, or this instance is in uh, serializable isolation. Um, I think that would actually help people. <coughs> But right now you can make a hook and I have some, some preliminary code for it. Um, let's see. There's, a, there's one called auth delay that does exactly this. It, it, lets, it basically just backs you, it just sends, it does a sleep before it returns, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, obviously it does it the second and further times. Um, How does it know that? How does it know that you... Well, it keeps them stayed around. 
what? It keeps some state around in that memory context. Okay. Um, so because Postgres's architecture at the moment is one process per backend, um, you could you can have um, state that you keep around for the length of the process, and that'll um, that'll generally um, do what you wanted. Uh, and yeah, somebody went and did their master's thesis, um, replacing the traveling salesman problem solver with a simulated annealing solver, which at that time anyway, um, was almost as good as the, the TSP based one. And I don't know if that says bad things about where the, the, um, the optimizer was at that point, or <laughs> whether it says that this guy was genius because <laughs> he managed to do the entire thing in like three years. Um, so questions, comments, brick bats. Yeah, question. So uh, the hooks run uh, in process with, um, with the server if you crash, you crash the server? Uh, the question was the hooks run in process with the server and if you crash you crash the server so um, Not necessarily. I mean there are ways that it could crash like for example scribbling all over PG data yeah. <laughs> Right, so there there are ways to crash the server using them um, but they're um, as a rule they're attached to the back end that they run in so if that if your hook crashes in some like not deliberately destructive way, it just takes out the back end that you, um, that it was running in, and the rest of the uh, the rest of the back ends which have been um, forked are, are still running, okay. and you're still okay. So if, as long as it hasn't done a broadly destructive operation, and then the server will spin up a new back end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it? Sorry. Yes. The example you showed earlier. I load the loading and extension in the current session. So presumably the hook initialization and destruction was uh, loadable through that one process. Yes. In the normal case where you use auto system, is the, that happening inside the master process before the fork? Or is initialization deferred until after connections? Or? Uh, the question was when do preloaded things actually get loaded into the. Um, into the process space and the answer is I need to get back to you on that and please remind me afterwards because I, I don't want to make I don't want to answer in, in territory I don't know yes so if your so if your hook does crash um, I mean it may not take down the whole server but if it did something I mean you know if, if you have a bug that's crashing the same amount of, I mean there's no way that whatever you've hooked into is going to ever complete until you fix that right or my misunderstanding is it the question was if the the hook crashes then uh there's no way that it can, is there a way that the thing that it hooked could ever complete and the answer is no okay. um the 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 it, it's the hook's responsibility to hand back control and if it's crashed it can't hand back control um and you're kind of stuck there yes so, I mean, your example of this hook, if I have correct, is we were uh, inserting and deleting. Um, so I kind of have two questions. Is um, Out of those 82 hooks that you mentioned, what are some of the more popular locations in those processes? And how does this system know where to insert the hook that you want it to do and what that does? Um, so the question was basically, uh, what are popular hooks and how does the system know which place to, to hook the code? Mm -hmm. So that's where those, um, that, that's where all those uh, headers and the data types for the hook come in. Mm -hmm. it is because I had a post parse analyze hook, that's how the system knows that a post parse analyze thing is, is going in there. Um, if I made it some other kind of hook, then it would have executed there, assuming that I had all the right headers to make it actually function. Mm -hmm. um, so the, so the, the answer is basically that each hook has its own type. Mm -hmm. you, have to spec you must specify that type, and that's how you're communicating to the system that the hook is going right there. <coughs> Can one library hook multiple hooks? or they, they each have to be their own separate 
um, uh, PG in it. Can the, so, right, the question was, can one library have multiple hooks? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the case that's commonest, and it's, it's already pretty rare, like hooks are pretty far out in the, in the, the space of exotic stuff that you do with Postgres. So um, the, the thing that's more common that I've seen anyway is that two different libraries would be attached to two different hooks and then you just want to make sure that they're executing in an order that makes sense. Um, ideally, you want them to, you know, commute because <laughs> you don't want something quite that, you know, fiddly and delicate in your, um, in your hook code. And we, you know, I guess at some point we might change how the ordering, uh, how the order of hooks firing goes. But uh, let's see, how would that work? You, yeah, you could make a, sh you could make, uh, yeah, each shared library would have to have just one PG in it and one PG Fini in it, as far as I, as far as I know. Okay, I was mainly thinking, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. So the actual hook itself is basically just throwing a function in a global variable, right? You're updating a global variable in your init. So you could update multiple variables. You can, as long as you have, got, have each hook within your library uh, have the right code, you could, uh, in the end, just uh, update three different global variables to update three different hooks. Yes, you could have multiple different hooks in your code, I think. Um, I say I think because I'm not sure whether See how would this work? I'm not sure if PG in it if in it could actually have some logic in there as to which hook it's looking at. I'm not sure how it would be able to tell any such a thing. I can't think of a use case for it. I was just thinking, what if I had something I wanted to do and I needed to hook multiple places to do the thing I wanted to do? I think you probably just want multiple hooks. Gotcha. Um, and it's, uh, frankly, it's a little easier to sort of test and debug, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> each hook separately. And then, you know, when you decide to combine them, you can test the combinations yeah. um, as, a, as a thing that you're doing for integration testing. So like your unit tests would be on single hooks and your integration and system tests would be kind of on the, the, the multiple hook scenario, whatever it was that you were doing. Um, anyway, so lots has already been done here. Your imagination is really the main limit. And as always, when you're writing code, have some fun with it. <laughs> um, just like this week, somebody decided to write new hooks for session start and session end. Um, don't know about session end ones precisely, but at session start, you can picture something, uh, the back end preparing a bunch of queries that are getting ready to be executed so the client code doesn't have to worry about it and the pooler doesn't have to worry about state. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if anybody uses prepared queries, but they're, they're, they're this rare thing that's both a uh, security feature and a performance feature at the same time. So what they do is they let you make a parameterized query um, and do that, uh, do that parsing just the one time. Um, and then because it produces a specific uh, abstract syntax tree, there's not ways to inject more code in there because like more code isn't, there isn't a place for it. Like by the time you're done, it's got a space for this integer and that varchar and that point, And that's, that's all you can put into it. Um, so uh, it's also a performance thing because uh, parsing takes time and 
if you just have the, the AST ready to go with just parameters to put in there, um, it takes less time. So you have both the security and the, um, and the performance that you, that you might want. Um, anyway, really appreciate y'all coming out tonight and taking the time. Thank you.